And I remember walking down the hallway one day and all of a sudden it just occurred to me, like I wanna be a writer. Good news is uh, you can write, so I don't have to teach you how to write. So the bad news is you don't know how to sell. Great time to talk about ChatGPT. The output that I got was not something I would turn into the client. <laughs> Let's be honest. Hello everyone. Welcome to Bell of Podcast. And today we have a special guest, Ryan Healy, who is a renowned expert in copywriting, email marketing, and list management. Uh, Ryan. Hey, Alex. Hi. Could you please introduce yourself quickly? We don't need so much detail, details at the beginning because I have some really interesting questions for you during our uh, podcast. But just a quick, sure. quick presentation would be really cool to, to, to know you. Sure. Yeah. Um, my name is Ryan Healy. I've been a freelance copywriter since uh, 2005, um, full-time copywriter since 2002. And about 18 months ago, I partnered with Justin Francisco, and he and I now run a list management agency called Upsender. Mm -hmm. And so that's become a primary focus for me uh, instead of the copywriting. Um, and then outside of business, um, Married 24 years and I've got six kids. So <laughs> that's that's really that's really interesting point I'd like to discuss about further because I have two kids by myself, but a six is a is a great number, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So we'll start with copywriting part and then we'll talk about up. Uh, upsender a lot, I'm sure. But let's let's let me introduce myself quickly in case someone doesn't know who am I. Uh, I'm Alex. Uh, I'm founder of Bill of Digital. We do website designs and development, and we prefer really complex project. And during this year, we try to focus on web service and SaaS creation, so cloud services, everything related to the cloud app, apps on web. That's what we are all about. But back to back to Ryan. All right. So I would like to start with the initial question, how it all started. So having like more than 20 years of experience in copywriting means you really love it. And it was your passion from the beginning. But if I'm wrong, please correct me. So I'd like to know how it all, it all started. How did you get in love with copywriting and email marketing and uh, everything related to that? Yeah, so, I mean, it kind of goes back all the way to eighth grade when I had an English teacher who I really loved. And I remember walking down the hallway one day and all of a sudden it just occurred to me, like, I want to be a writer. That's what I want to do. And so from that point on in high school, um, I, I joined journalism. I did the newspaper as many years as I could do it while I was there. I did journalism again in a community college. Uh, but then from there, like I kind of went a different way. I did wire closet shelving <laughs> for a summer job. And then I got hired at Merrill Lynch in the 401k uh, division. And then things were not going well there. And a family friend had a homeschooling company called Sunlight. And he came to me and he said, hey, would you be interested in this marketing position? Because I'm having trouble filling it. So he hired me to write a couple assignments. Um, just to see. And he said, he said, well, the good news is uh, you can write. So I don't have to teach you how to write. He said, the bad news is you don't know how to sell. He's like, but I think I can teach you that. So if you're willing to come over here with me at Sunlight, I'll teach you everything I know and I'll give you access to my library and all my stuff and, and uh, we'll go from there. And so I agreed. I actually took a pay cut and went over to Sunlight and worked there for three years uh, before quitting that job and then ultimately becoming a freelance copywriter. So, But you yeah, also got, got some knowledge how, got how, how to sell, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that was, that was a very formative experience for me. Uh, it, was, it was very difficult because John was, if something was good, he wouldn't say, oh, this is good. Mm -hmm. he would, but if something was bad, he would just rip it to shreds. Like... And so you know, you're just like, do you like anything that I write? You know, is <laughs> am I doing anything well? He's like, well, if I like it, then and I don't say any. If I don't say anything, that means I like it. I was like, oh, okay. Well, it'd be nice to get some positive reinforcement 
you know, in this journey. Um, but the cool part was, is I had, I had a lot of leeway at a certain point. And so I was able to, um, come up with promotional, promotional ideas on my own and then get approval for those and then write the copy for them. And at that time I was managing their email list, which was like 35,000 people back in, wow. um, 2002, three, four. Right. And, uh, it was just a once a week newsletter, but then I could put my promotions in there. So, um, I did a couple that were very, very successful one for a puzzle, believe it or not. And then another one for microscopes and my whole pitch to them there was, Hey, why don't we raise the price of the microscopes and run a year end sale at the old price? <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So we did that and I sold, um, I think it was over $150,000 worth of microscopes. Wow. So, Inspiring. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So and of course all that experience was, gave me a lot of confidence like later to go out. It was like, I knew that I could sell stuff. I knew that I could get results. All right. But do you think that, that that first experience you had at Sunlight was really, really important for your future career in copywriting and further in sales as well? I think it was, I mean, it gave me a great foundation. Um, and it's, It's one of those things where I wasn't making that much money at the time, but I got to put in a lot of reps, you know, writing, writing catalog copy and, and sales articles and, and managing the email list and things like that. So, um, I do, I do think that it helped quite a bit. Um, at the same time I was studying things on my own, like the AWAI, uh, six figure copywriting course. I did that whole thing and did the correspondence and all that. I did that on my own. Mm -hmm. Something like that too, I think can help a lot, um, before you kind of shove off and try to get clients. All right. Yeah. Because I, I was asking about this because I, I hear pretty often that that moment sometimes is really, really important for people who just start their career in, uh, in any, any kind of business. So when they found kind of mentor or, um, I don't know how to say Some, somebody can say that mm -hmm. it's just your, your boss, but it, it can be just a boss or it can be someone who teach you the most important things and people start working somewhere, get this experience and start their own business. And they always say it was, mm -hmm. it was my life changing moment. Um, yes. So yeah. yeah. I, I didn't have one because it definitely was a pivot. Yeah. So that, that's cool. And I think you you were kind of lucky because for example, I didn't have that moment and I learned everything by myself. I started as a hobby, mm. did websites. I had a long career in, in retail companies. I, I, I tried to, to grow up in them and get better positions year by year. But at, the, at some point I, I just got this hobby and it became my profession and my business. Um, mm. But I, 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 I wish I could help someone Who, who will explain me how market works, how business works, and how how web development works. But now I know everything, and I, I hope I'll, I'll <laughs> help someone, or I'm helping right now someone in my team uh, to get this knowledge, to get this experience, and uh, uh, like develop these skills in, in them. All right, that's, yes. that's cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, but, I know a lot of copywriters on the market and a lot, a lot of them were all, all the time, 10 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, it wasn't so popular profession, but right now I receive around 20, 30 friend re requests on LinkedIn every day. And, uh, I think more than a half of them is copywriting expert, copywriting specialist, copywriting business owner. Wow. Yeah, right. But we know why wow. it happens. And we talk, we'll, I hope we'll talk about this a little bit later, about AI, about everything related to AI and how it affects copywriting. Sure. But I think it started not just two, one, two years ago. It was, it was before. And, uh, But at the same time, because we use copywriters a lot in our business, I know how difficult to find a good one. So 
for these mm -hmm. years, I'm sure you you made it not just a copywriting as as it is, but kind of science of copywriting. So that that's what I would like to know more. How how did you lift this copywriting to the level of science? And most probably you you had to know some psychology principles. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the science side of it is is you know everybody can look at copy and have their own opinion about it, you know, yeah. like, Oh, I like it. I don't like it, but that's really ultimately a little bit irrelevant because the market tells you if the copy is going to work or not. If people buy, then it's good copy. If they don't buy, then it's not good copy. You know, even if, even if you may might like it. Uh, so years ago, um, over 10 years ago, back when they had a Google optimizer, did, did you ever hear of that before? Not sure, not sure, not sure. What did it? <laughs> it was, it was a multivariate split testing software. Okay. That Google offered. So you could uh, set up the code yeah. on your landing page and then you could install, um, say, two or three different headlines mm -hmm. and then two or three different leads and mm -hmm. then maybe two or three different photos, right? Mm -hmm. And multivariate takes all the different combinations and then cycles through all the possibilities of those, you know, combinations mm -hmm. and then measures the conversion rate. And then over time, one will come ahead and it will say, this is, this is your winner. All right. So it's um, kind of a B so, test tool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's like an AB test tool, but it does a little bit more. So what I would do with clients is say, Hey, I'll, I'll set up this multivariate split testing for you on the copy that I wrote. And so then we would, we would get that going. And that was one of the ways that I kind of set myself apart was, you know, relying on the numbers and then testing and trying to find the best combination mm -hmm. for them. Um, so that's part of the science. I mean, the science really is the testing, right? The science is looking at the numbers and, you know, following where the numbers lead you. Um, you know, obviously the client still has to like the copy enough to be willing to run it, you know, cause so you, you have to please the client first mm -hmm. and then you have to please the market. So sometimes when you please the client, then the market doesn't like it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I feel you because I think we experience sometimes the same kind of issue with our business as well. Yes. And I think it's important to, yeah. to explain clients that what we try to do is to reach your conversion goals, try to reach you the better results. And uh, you trust us, you trust our designer, you trust our developers that we can do something that works for your, for your audience, for your clients. Mm -hmm. and if they trust us or trust you, I think sometimes this issue may go on, but I, I know that not every client is so flexible. And so, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, to, to understand that market, market, marketing importance is, is much more important than his liking. But I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. I know right. what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you've got the two, the two sides that you're managing. Um, you know, you talked about uh, psychology. I mean, yes, you've got to have a deep understanding of human behavior mm -hmm. and what motivates people and, and what they're trying to either get or avoid, you know, pain, the pain and pleasure, um, and how you're going to position the product to your, to the customer. Are you going to focus more on what they can get, what they can attain or how your product is going to solve a pain point? Usually it's both, but you've got to lead kind of with one or the other. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, but have you studied it somewhere apart from your high school and everything in your basic education? Did you did you go through any courses or you found some experts and you had some private lessons? How how did it happen? Um, mostly, I mean, obviously, John played a big part in mm -hmm. mentoring me in the beginning. And so I, I ended up reading a lot of different marketing books at that time. You know, I read mar books from Seth Godin, um, Al Reese's book on branding. I think I started getting the Dan Kennedy stuff back then, um, the ultimate sales letter, um, and some of his books. 
Um, I also read a lot of the older stuff, so Scientific Advertising and My Life in Advertising by Claude Hopkins. I really enjoyed both of those books. I've read Scientific Advertising, I think, three times. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, you know, another one was Joe Sugarman, you know, his book Triggers. It's, uh, I think, 30 plus psychological triggers to use um, when you're selling, as well as his uh, handbook on copywriting. Um, yeah, I've got a, a ton of business books on the shelf behind here. Yeah, I see. <laughs> <laughs> I, never, I never went to college for, and it's actually, it keeps going. There's okay. three shelves. Okay. Um, but I've, I've never taken any formal mm. training, like out of school or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, I've, I've purchased programs, um, like the AWAI six figure copywriting course, which I did that, I uh, went through that entire course. Um, so all of those things have contributed over time, um, to my knowledge. And what you find is that, you know, there's, there's fundamentals of copywriting, and then there's also some specific things that apply in certain niches, right? So when I got into financial copywriting more heavily. This was probably around uh, 2013 or something, 2012, 2013. Um, I had to learn how to write stock tease sales letters, right? Have you heard of those? Um, can you repeat, please? Yeah, uh, stock tease sales letters. Have you heard of no, that type no, of copy? No. So you take one uh, stock on the stock market, yep. you know, or mm -hmm. ticker symbol, mm -hmm. and you try to write an entire promotion teasing what that stock is. Mm -hmm. And then they have to buy the, the newsletter to discover which stock it is to invest in. Mm -hmm. So that, that is um, a specific type of sales letter just for financial publishers, right? That you wouldn't really ever use anywhere else other than that one niche. Okay. But it's very yeah. specific and focused on just every, every stock. Yeah, just one, just one, just stock. one stock. Yeah. Which, which means you have to understand this industry a lot. Yeah, and you, and you have to be good at teasing, you know, teasing the reader with all these reasons why this stock is going to make them money and why they should invest now and, you know, yada, yada, all that stuff. So, okay. Anyway, so some of that stuff, uh, the reason I brought that up is because sometimes you don't learn about these things until you're actually working with a client and then they're kind of teaching you this is the model that we use in this industry. Okay. Uh, would you like to have some courses or additional education at the moment, or do you think that all you have is the perfect, perfect, uh, tools you can use in copywriting and email marketing? I mean, may, uh, not, not just for you, but probably, you know, some great courses that you could, could recommend to our watchers, our uh, auditory. Yeah. Um, so, See, is maybe two years ago mm -hmm. now. I took a course with Lucas Rasheski. Um, I'm not sure the official name of it, uh, but I took some some training with him just to kind of brush up on my skills and and um, see if there's anything I was missing there. And it was fun to do the assignments and go through and and um, really focus on learning again. Um, so, you know, I found value in that and, but I would say yes, like continue. I mean, it doesn't really matter where you're at in your career. I think it's always important to continue learning. Yeah. Um, and, and periodically brushing up, but still the best thing for a copywriter to be doing is writing copy and getting feedback from the market. Right. So if you know, your market really, really well, then 
you can be an average copywriter and still sell and still make a lot of money, right? Because you just know the market so well. And that's, that's the biggest key is just understanding your market and understanding how to write to them, understanding what they want, what they don't want and all that. So you could bring in, um, you know, a famous copywriter who's considered the best of the best. And if he's not familiar with that market, then he might struggle at first because he's going to have to, you know, get into the minds of the customers and really learn. Right. All right. So does it mean that you recommend for copywriters to be focused on some specific industries, sorry, industries, or it, it doesn't matter and you can like research and, and any new industry for any new client? What, what, what do you recommend them to do to focus on some specific niche? Like, I don't know, real estate or financial markets. Mm -hmm. Um, I think if you're first starting out and you don't have a lot of experience in, in different markets, I feel like it's, it's fine to be a generalist and kind of take what comes to you. Mm -hmm. So, um, but then after you work in a few different markets, you may figure out, oh, okay, I kind of like this better than I like that. And so I would recommend picking a niche and, and trying to specialize to a degree. Um, and that's one of the regrets I have is that I took so long to, to specialize. So, and as soon as I specialized and said, oh, I'm a financial copywriter, the funny part was, is I got more work that way, but then I would also have people come and they would say, oh, you're a financial copywriter, but can you write for health? Oh, you're, oh, you're this, but can you still help me with this project? So it was like, it didn't eliminate all this stuff. It actually just caused more people to come to me, mm. um, which I found really interesting. Um, and that's why I say, I wish I had specialized earlier. Um, and also it's just easier if you're kind of in one market and you kind of know how to work in that market. It's just, you don't, it's, you don't have to start over, you know, when you're jumping into a different market. So I feel like it speeds up the process of writing copy. Um, so yeah, that's what I would do. Start start broad, but then don't wait too long before you choose a niche. All right. Makes sense, makes sense. Um I think now it's a great time to talk about ChatGPT and similar okay. AIs. Um I know we have different opinions every every person may have different opinion and it, depending on whether they are really good copywriters or they are just web designers that need to fill some pages with them, some information then they don't care about the quality and results and conversion this like this content may create especially about as seo so they they just don't matter but there are some people who really care about the quality of the content still. And I'm sure you're one of them. I know you just said you mm -hmm. focused on uh, your app sender, but, app sender, but uh, anyways, what do you think about mm -hmm. this uh, AI uh, presence? And uh, what I think even more interesting, what do you think will happen in a couple years with copywriting market? And with us trying to read the unique content instead of finding every piece of this chat generated generated text here and there, because just a simple example, I I try to hire good developers, and I need to understand what mm -hmm. what their skills, what is their experience. I don't care like if you don't have much experience, we can offer you a junior position, but you have to be honest with us. And when I read mm -hmm. uh, there are CVs, a couple of years ago, it was almost, I mean, zero help from someone for them to write their CV. So it was re really easy and fast for me to understand. This, this person may fit our position. This definitely not. Right now, mm -hmm. For last year, I received maybe 70% of CVs written in ChatGPT. 
and most of them completely made in ChatGPT. I think they probably correct something um, with it with its help, but it still doesn't look real. And even worse, when I try to discuss it with them on call or some somehow else, I I realized that a lot of written skills or experience they just don't have it. So. Some people try to use CVs and these ChatGPT stuff just to promote themselves and with some miracle hope that it may help them to get the job of their dream. In fact, of course not. Mm -hmm. Even you, you, you get this job on first or second day, everybody understands you, you know nothing. So bye-bye. So what do you think <laughs> about this approach? What do you think about future of, of content creation and how to stay creative and authentic and unique in this world of computer-generated content? Yeah. Well, I think uh, on the copywriting side, if you're, if you're not a very good copywriter and you're relying on ChatGPT or any other AI language model mm -hmm. that you're probably not going to last long because if you can't produce really high quality stuff, then why does the client need you? You know, they can go to chat GPT and generate it themselves and probably get the same or better, you know, than somebody who's not talented. I think AI can, is still valuable. It can help somebody like me or somebody with a lot of experience to generate some ideas more quickly or to summarize some, some, uh, concepts or ideas. Um, I wrote, um, six emails for a client this week and, uh, most of them I wrote from scratch. Uh, two of them, I used some AI, uh, to generate some, some text. Um, but based, but with email, you know, you, you want it to tie in with the sales page so you can take the sales page and then you can have, you can pull things out of the sales page and then write an email around that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, now the, the output that I got was not something I would turn into the client. Okay. Uh, but there was, but there was a little bit of good stuff mm -hmm. in the middle and that was literally the same copy on the sales page, but it had been kind of condensed and summarized a little bit. And, um, so then I rewrote some subject lines and rewrote the, the copy and made it flow and everything. So, um, for somebody who is experienced in and, and produces good copy, then chat GPT can help with speed, right? Sometimes if you're looking at a, at a blank document and maybe you're low on motivation that day, you're like, oh gosh, okay, where do I start? You know, well, sometimes you can use chat GPT once just to get some ideas flowing and then boom, you're off to the races and now you can just keep going. Right, you don't need it anymore. It's just kind of a, a starter, the kind of ideas. inspiration or just second opinion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, there are other things you can use it for to to speed things up. I've told it to like I've pasted stuff in there. I'm like, remove all these characters, and then boom, it does it. You know, <laughs> that's what. So they instead do. of me manually <laughs> fixing. <laughs> that's yeah, what instead they of do. me manually like going there and, and fixing it myself. Yeah. It's just like, here, remove this stuff that I don't want in this copy. And it does it, you know? So, um, in terms of content, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't write content for clients. I never have. Uh, but if somebody were writing content, um, it's really hard to say where that's going to go. Uh, you know, I've seen stories of people just ripping site maps and then duplicating a site and then doing it better and with AI copy, and then all of a sudden their, their SEO goes up and they're getting all sorts of traffic. Right. But then you have to ask yourself, how long is that going to last? Is that just a, a little tiny window of time where there's this arbitrage happening and then somehow Google's going to shut it down. Right. Um, I think from a, a value perspective, the, the value is going to come in with your own stories you know, the stories that you have, your own personal life experience and how you can communicate those stories to your market, right? Because AI doesn't have real stories. You know, AI is just regurgitating, recycling things. 
Um, but people want to feel connected to, to a person and they, they want to know that that person is real. So, uh, Sam Woods, who's an AI expert has talked about this is that AI is actually going to force us to become more human. Does that make sense? I, I, I think yes. I think yes. And especially that we still have to create something unique to this world. We've talked with uh, an, yeah. another guest uh, on the previous podcast, and yeah, we, we, we thought about the same. Like, if you do not create any content, <laughs> even ChatGPT may not work well because they don't have enough sources. So we, if we stop creating, yeah. it, it, it will stop creating as well. <laughs> so anyways, it's based on our experience yeah, and our true. creation. So people still, yeah, yeah, I absolutely understand it. And it's good to hear that you use this tool and not against this tool like, hey, this is hell. I'm not, I'm not going to use it at all. That's, that's smart. But yeah, using it in, in a smart way, much better and we use it in our team and and for different purposes for example create a good proposal for the client good proposal mm -hmm. sometimes takes time to create now we save like 80 percent of the time for this for this specific request sure. so then why not i mean sure we we can write down sure. our thoughts but they don't look so cool like after after like ai so yeah exactly yeah but anyways, yeah, my partner has done. Yeah. 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 What, what about your I would partner? say my partner has done the same, same, same sort of thing with operations, right? Mm -hmm. If there's something that you have to do frequently, that's in a specific format or template or whatever, you know, you can just say, Hey, chat GPT, clean this up, make it read better, you know, and, and that's, you know, a great use of it, I think, you know, in business operations. Yeah, right. And so. even you can create your own kind of micro, ch micro chat GPT that will have your input data, like, hey, this this channel is for clients' proposals. You have to consider that we are a web development company, blah, 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 blah. And uh, you already have like a framework. So you can just upload your proposal draft and, and get a ready proposal in a minute and you bam, you're good to go. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's, that's cool. That's what I wanted to know. And, uh, you also mentioned about content. So could you quickly explain for someone who, who is watching this video and not sure what the difference between content creation and copywriting just quickly, the main difference. Sure. Sure. So, Content would be um, information that's presented in an article format. And usually the purpose of content is to educate um, your market, um, to build authority, perhaps, uh, maybe for, for search engine optimization, to get traffic, something like that. So usually that's the purpose of content. Uh, sales copy, on the other hand, is designed to get the reader to take action and that action is usually to purchase the product or the service that you're selling but sometimes it could be to enter your email and click the submit button you know subscribe to my newsletter or donate to this charity or call us right so so long as there's some sort of persuasion involved in the copy to get the person to take an action mm -hmm. that's sales copy um, most content isn't really like that. You know, most content is just, you know, maybe take, for example, healthline.com or Mayo Clinic or something, you know, they dominate the search results now for just about anything related to health. You type in some sort of skin condition and it's like, here's all about your skin condition. Here's what it's caused by, how diet may affect it, drugs that you can take. Yeah. But talk to your doctor. <laughs> Right. Yeah, very straightforward. Thank you very much. I think we clarify this once and for for everyone. All right. So um, yeah, next questions I wanted to ask about your typical like clients and what they need usually. But I think we already discussed this a little bit. And probably I would like to move to your main current business that you launched recently, uh, Upsender. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. when you mentioned for me that you you would like to talk about lease management, for me it's kind of I I don't have enough information I would say so 
I would like to learn more mm -hmm. about this management, why it's so important, how it affects business results and like how it makes more money for your clients. And but let's start from from the beginning. Can you like tell again what is Upsender about and uh, why did you decide to, sure. to build your this company, this um, we may call a startup, right? For for and and who's your co-founders? Yeah. Uh, so Justin Francisco is my business partner, and the company is Upsender, and that's Upsender.com, and we're an email list management agency that works primarily in the health and weight loss uh, space. So um, people hire list management companies to basically take over their email list and make sure that emails are being sent out on a regular basis and to uh, make sure that it's generating revenue. There's a lot of stuff that goes into that, like deliverability, which is making sure that um, the email service provider, the ESP is set up properly and that the domains are authenticated and um, you're following all the best practices to get into the inboxes, right? Because if you do things wrong, your emails won't get delivered. So a big part of what we do is, is making sure everything is set up properly. And then we then take over the calendar. And so the people that we work with, we're, we're mailing for most, almost all of our clients, we're mailing at least one email a day, mm. sometimes two emails a day. And all of those emails, uh, most of those emails are sales oriented. We do send out some content here and there to kind of build uh, goodwill with the subscribers. But the goal is, is to sell as much as we can and maximize uh, the, the revenue. So. Um, how we do that is also a little bit different depending on whether the client has back-end products or not. So a lot of times in the health space, let's say they're selling a supplement, right? Mm -hmm. They sell the supplement and then the upsells are buy more of that supplement, right? And then they're a customer, but then after that, they don't have any more products to sell to them. Mm -hmm. Like they sold them their one supplement. So, we run, we'll run um, like monthly promotions for that same supplement they bought, but what do you send them on the other 26 days of the month, right? Because like there's, mm -hmm. he doesn't have any other products to sell. So list manager comes in and now we're sending out affiliate promotions for other health products pretty much daily, right? And so that's, that's one of the ways we do that. We, we then negotiate uh, the highest payouts that we can get so whether it's rev, rev share or uh, CPA, mm -hmm. CPA is cost per acquisition. Um, so we'll, we'll try to get the highest payouts and then we'll make sure that the money's being paid out. And we'll make sure the client's getting paid. So it's a huge amount of work and effort that the client just doesn't have to worry about. They just sit back and then they just collect money. <laughs> Sounds perfect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but. Uh, does it mean that you can affect a business in some ways? For example, you said probably it, it's a good idea to add some more products to your to your shop, or instead of this mm -hmm. one item, let's create like five or ten items or something else. Or does it mean that you don't yeah. bother your client at all and do everything by your own, and they just get your reports that these kind of emails has been sent, these results has been received and thanks and, and, and they send you like sales results. How does it work? Yeah, we um it it depends on the client, but uh yeah, we've we've gone to some clients who are like, hey, you know, you've got this product that's doing really well on the front end. Like why don't you you know you're selling an informational product. Why don't you create a supplement on the back end that would you know, solve the same pain point. Um, but some of our clients don't want to do that. They're like, well, I don't, I don't want to create more products. It's just, it, it complicates my business and I don't want to do that. So if they don't want to do that, then we're kind of left with affiliate uh, promotions, you know, promoting other people's products. Mm -hmm. And so um, if somebody does extend their product line and they have a couple extra products, well, then that's good for us because usually the buyers on that list are going to buy more 
of an internal product than they will of an affiliate product. So if, if we can promote internal products, we make more money, the client makes more money. Um, and so in some cases we do have clients that, that do have a handful of products and we make sure to promote those every single month. So those are just, they get permanent spots on the calendar and, um, you know, we, we split test copy and we split test subject lines and from names and things like that. So we're always trying to optimize and make sure we're getting, um, the best results that we can from the work that we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Who, yeah. who can be your client? Is there any specific requirements you, 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 you have to, to choose your clients or there is some specific industries or niches you'd like to focus on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, we can onboard somebody in the health and weight loss space the easiest because that's where we do most of our business right now. And so we already have relationships established and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, ideally we're looking for somebody with a list of, you know, I would say at least 15,000 people, uh, and not leads like buyers. So our ideal client has an offer that's already working somewhere. They're either, um, generating sales through affiliate traffic or paid traffic. Mm -hmm. They're generating say 50, 50 to hundred sales a day. And they already have a list that's in an ESP and they just want somebody to come in and take that take over that process for them and so we that's what we do we come in we, we try to make it turnkey as much as possible so they don't have to do a lot of work but we just take over the daily operations of managing that email list and making money from it and so then that way they can focus on optimizing the front end driving more buyers onto their list or creating new products, you know, creating another front end product or creating a back end product that they can sell to their list. So that's kind of our, our ideal client right now. Um, we are, uh, experimenting with getting into home services. So that's kind of what's on our radar for this year. Um, and to help home service businesses who have customers on their email list that often are not being emailed at all. And so, we're, we're kind of already working with, um, I think two different people. And so we're kind of starting to build that. And, and if we can make that work, then that will be a second, a second market that we're operating in. Understand. And what, what apps or software do you recommend for, for the clients to, to use, to collect emails and, uh, prepare lists and manage them properly mm -hmm. in terms of let's say they want to work with you, what would you prefer to have mm -hmm. like Salesforce or something else? Well, our favorite is Meropost. And, uh, I can put that in the chat. It's spelled M A R O P O S T Meropost. Meropost. Okay. And yeah, that's, that's, uh, most of our clients are on that uh, our, their lists are with that company. And oftentimes we're trying to migrate them from their current ESP onto Mero post because there are, you know, limitations, uh, with a lot, you know, we've, I've worked in a ton of different ESPs and, um, a lot of them have limitations, uh, that make it more difficult for us to manage the list. Mm -hmm. So we're very familiar with Mero post. It, it has extremely good deliverability. Um, and uh, a lot of different features that we can use from, from journeys to split testing and all that. You know, something that Meropost does and uh, that we like is you can set up split tests and say, um, I wanna test this email and I wanna test two emails, but I only wanna send version A to let's say 15% of the list mm -hmm. and B to 15% of the list and then measure the click through rate for two hours or three hours or four hours. You can decide on the time frame, and then whichever one has the highest click through rate, send that to the rest of the list, the other 70%, mm -hmm. right? So you're getting like a, a split test, but then the winner goes out automatically to most of the list. So that way, if you were just doing like a 50, 50, you'd be losing out a lot of clicks, right? Cause the, the loser would go to half the list and the winner would go to half the list. So that's, 
that's one of the features that, that they have. Um, on the e-commerce side, so there's kind of two halves to, uh, to clients. You know, there's some that are more e-commerce and there's some that are more direct response. So direct, um, should I clarify that, what those two things mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so direct response is when you're trying to get people to take, to buy now, buy today. Yeah. And e-commerce is usually more of a brand, you know, they're not as pushy. It's kind of like, here's our product, take it or leave it. <laughs> if you're doing more e-commerce branded style marketing, then Klaviyo is pretty much the, you know, the best email service provider in that space. No, really. um, Klaviyo or Klaviyo. I don't, I don't know how the correct way to say it, but yeah, it's very popular as well. I, I've never heard about yeah, the first yeah. one. Um, mirror post you said, mm -hmm. yeah, but we heard about Klaviyo a lot, <clears throat> but let's say client comes with, uh, I don't know, HubSpot or even Google sheets. Is it possible for you to work with it? Um, HubSpot probably yes. Uh, well, it again, it depends on what we're doing. So some ESPs will not permit um, affiliate promotions, mm -hmm. right? So like none of our clients are on MailChimp, you know, we're not going to use MailChimp, mm -hmm. you know, cause they'll shut you down if you send an affiliate promotion. Um, and there are a lot of others that don't really like affiliate promotions. So again, it depends on what the client is wanting to do. Now, if they come to us with just a Google sheet, then usually we're not going to work with that client. Um, because it's, you know, it, it's a lot of work to import records into an ESP and warm up the ESP and get the emails delivering. Um, that's just a, a difficult process. It's time consuming and it doesn't always work. Sometimes it doesn't because it, it depends on like, okay, well, when was the last time these people were emailed? And usually it's like, oh, we haven't emailed these people in two or three years. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, well, they're not going to remember you really. And so you send out an email and they're like, well, I don't remember this guy spam. And so then that just kills the reputation of the account. All right. So we can say that you, you focus more on moving the process to the next level or improving the process, process they already have. Yeah. But you do it yeah. following the best practices like domain warm up, everything. Yeah, usually our ideal client already has an, an ESP and their buyers are flowing into it and they're at least getting a handful of emails, right? Yeah. Because they're buyers. So it's like, thank you for your order and, you know, et cetera. But then some of those people, they need help with journeys. Like they may not have a, a, a cart abandonment sequence set up, you know, and they need something like that built for them. Or they may not have other sequences like reactivation sequences to, um, bring contacts that have kind of gone dormant and kind of wake them up and get them back into the daily emails. So we also do that for clients, like reactivating old records in their ESP. Um, and so that, that's just kind of going back to old records and make and mailing them again, basically, and getting them engaged again. I understand. Um, how, yeah. uh, so clients from, from the industries you mentioned, how they can contact you, what the best way to, to, to be in touch. Sure. Um, they can go to upsender.com or they can email me directly at Ryan at upsender.com. And, uh, I can type that out here. That's the, that's the best way I'm, you know, you can also look me up on Facebook or social media. I have profiles just about everywhere. <laughs> That's that's right, and um, including LinkedIn, <laughs> including LinkedIn, exactly. You also offer free audit. Is it correct? Yeah, we are willing to do a free audit. Um, that's on the website as well. You can see it there, um, and that's something where uh, we'll need to be able to log into your account and and basically 
see what the status is on everything, like how often you're mailing, what kind of open rates are you getting, what's your click-through rate, um, do you have journeys and automations set up, and just kind of seeing if there's opportunity for us to help you. Um, sometimes there's a small fix. I mean, like we did a free audit for a guy, and I, I turned up a problem for him, mm-hmm. and he fixed it. He didn't hire us, and that's fine, but, you know, it was a pretty serious issue on his side that was preventing his emails from getting delivered, so... Well, probably they don't hire you currently and hire you in the future, or they recommend you to someone else. Sure. Anyways, it's a available tool, sure. so I recommend to everyone to try a free audit. If you have lists already and you 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 work on them, you manage them, and they are fresh, <clears throat> your clients are ready to receive more emails and do it right. So feel free to to contact from upsender dot com. Um, thank you, Ryan. Um, another question I have, and I think it's even more important than all we talked before. I would like to talk a little bit about work-life balance. And, of course, okay. about your great family of six kids. How do you manage your balance considering that all of them need your help sometimes? And most probably not just yeah. sometimes, <laughs> let's be honest. <laughs> so just tell us about your experience. I'm sure they make your life so happy, but you have to work some, 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 some somehow, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, early in my career, I just decided that I was going to work from 8.30 in the morning mm-hmm. to about 5.30 to 6.30 at night, depending on the day. Mm-hmm. And I would take a lunch break, you know? Um, and so I see the kids and, and when I come out, I see the kids and they can ask me questions when I'm, you know, getting coffee or going to the bathroom or whatever. Um, but my wife, um, she does a great job, you know, keeping the kids occupied and, um, she does homeschool the younger kids. Uh, you know, one of my kids has now moved out and married, believe it or not. All right. And, All right. Uh, and, yeah, and then another one, uh, my son Owen, he actually works for Upsender. Wow. So he works for my company. Um, <laughs> That's then, smart. <laughs> That's smart. Yeah. And then the third the third born, Patrick, he's in high school, and then I got three littles after that. Um, but, yeah, I think it's just about being clear on on expectations. Like, hey, dad, dad needs to work. And why does dad need to work? Because... We need to earn money to pay for our house and our food and the activities that you guys do and kind of like, you know, letting them know, you know, that what I'm doing is important and supporting the family. So, and they, they respect that and they honor that. So it, or when they're really little, they don't, you know, it's like, just yeah. come on in and, you know, you know, but as they get older, they kind of go, you know, oh, don't bother dad. He's working, you know, and uh, so it's worked out well. And obviously I take weekends off and evenings off. We have family dinners every night and, you know, so it's all good. Wow. I, I think I, I'm not sure what's more impressive, this 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 approach to, to your family. So you're pretty confident that you do everything right. And these six kid, kids doesn't make you crazy. That's cool. And that you have your schedule is cool. But also that you can yeah, even you. have this like dinners with them every day. That's even even, even yeah. better. I think this oh, is you. really important. So apart from your job and your work uh, responsibility, what, what what do you do in your free time if you have free time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your uh, hobby or what, what do you like to do or what would you like to sure. start doing? Sure. No, I, I have a, a couple of hobbies. One is reading. Obviously, I love mm-hmm. to read. I run a book club. Um, it's It's remote. Uh, that the members are remote we're all in different areas but we get together about every four to eight weeks to discuss the book that we just read um so uh, that's a hobby i also love to ride my bike um uh, last year i finally cracked a thousand miles in the year okay um, it's kind of bicycle and yeah road road, road bicycle. bicycle okay uh, but i ride a i ride a recumbent bicycle so that's a little bit different which one um it's called a recumbent. What is it? Yeah, yeah. Let me let me put. Uh, I'll type it out here. Recumbent. Um, and if you want to see what it looks like, there's a website. Um, so it's a reclined riding position with your feet out front. 
Uh, all right, so you you're more sitting back and you you yeah yeah you but also the front. Okay. Yep. So yeah, I I love I love going out on bike rides when the weather is a little warmer than today. It's too cold today. <laughs> it's snowy. Um, okay. But uh, so those are my two main hobbies, I, I guess you could say, um, besides just family stuff, you know. And you even t have a time for it. <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I read about. I try to read about forty books a year. So. Is it mostly business books or kind of anything? I am all over the map, man. I read I read classic literature. I read fiction. I read history. I read uh, nutrition and and um, medical stuff. Um, I read business books. It's I read conspiracy books. I'm I'm all over the map. <laughs> yeah, but as you read a lot of books already, I'm sure you know how to choose the right one and you, I'm sure you have a list for the next years. So probably yeah. could you recommend a couple of most important maybe business books you would like to read and you recommend for uh, people to read and maybe not a business but some classical books you recommend, yeah. something really, really like basic but at the same time most most important books in 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 the people's life um on the business side i i recently read uh 10x is easier than 2x mm. by dan sullivan and i think benjamin hardy um and that one i really enjoyed i also really enjoyed uh i think it's gary keller's the one thing so if you have if you have issues with focusing or yeah, really just issues focusing, if you're distracted easily, you're chasing too many things, that book, the one thing I, I felt was really valuable. Um, uh, the 10 X is easier than two X is more about how to think about your business and how to, how to grow rapidly. Um, you know, rather than doing more of the same, which is what most people do, how to get outside of that so that you can grow more quickly. So that one, that one is really enjoyable. Um, uh, in terms of classic literature, you know, there's no accounting for taste, right? Like some people, it just depends on what you like, but uh, Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy, what I read a couple of years ago, and that was just incredible. I love Cormac McCarthy's uh, writing, uh, but he's, you know, he's pretty dark too at times. Um, so I'd recommend that one. Earlier this year, I read Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't rate that one quite as highly, but it's still, it, I'm still super glad I read it. It's, it's, um, it's a powerful novel. Um, but yeah, there's, I mean, I could go on and on about classics. And <laughs> All right, I think this is enough for the beginning. <laughs> Talking about those. Yeah, and I think, yeah, yeah. I, because I know that people would love to read, but sometimes they struggle to find the right book to start with. And do yeah. you post somewhere your lists of books? For example, you plan to, to read these books for the next year, for this 2024. Uh, did you post this list of books for in your social media probably? Hmm, that's a good question. I've never I've never posted a list of the books that I'm, I'm about to read, but um, I do share, I write a review of every single book I read on Goodreads. So goodreads.com, um, all, all my books are there with reviews. So uh, if you ever are interested in reviewing any of the, or uh, seeing what I've read, I track it all there. Um, mm -hmm. But if I was gonna put uh, a list together of books that are on my list, I'd probably just, I'd probably publish it to, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Yeah, at the same that's time. what I would so like to suggest. I, I mean, I would love to see this on LinkedIn, yeah. and this this, yeah. this is really available for clients and for your subscribers. I would be personally interested to see this list um, because yeah. sometimes it's an inspiration, sometimes it's just knowledge and some useful information that I, I'm, I'm not sure what book to sure. start with or I, I think I, I, I'll, I would like to start 
but what I should I take for the for for the beginning? What people read in this year? Because I know there is right. classical books, but also business books get outdated quickly. And right now we have mm -hmm. really good authors who write really interesting books, and they are fresh, and they work with the current market, which is rapidly changing. So I think it's important to see a fresh, fresh opinion and fresh opinion, especially from the. I I, may, I I think I may call you a like books expert, reading expert, because mm -hmm. it's your passion as well. So yeah, if you would post yeah. it, I would definitely repost it and use by sure. myself as well. So please, <laughs> if you if you get a, get a three minute, um, all right. And uh, I I would like to hear some advice from you for the people who watch us and still don't find the, didn't find the right balance between their work and their free time, maybe their family, maybe they're alone and completely like very deep in their, in their business, in their freelancing career. But what do you recommend to do now so they don't regret about it after 10, 20, 30 years? Um. Well, sometimes work-life balance is affected by your expenses, right? Your expenses are too high, and so you're working a lot to try to keep up with your expenses. So sometimes work-life balance is about reducing your expenses to a more manageable level so you don't have to work quite as many hours or work quite as hard. So that's one thing. Um, Sometimes if you're if you're more of like a workaholic type, you just like to work and you just have a hard time pulling yourself away. Uh, for me, I find it's just helpful to get, you know, just say like, OK, I need to get away from my computer for a little bit. Go walk outside, you know, maybe even go on a walk, mm -hmm. even if it's just 10, 15 minutes, get the blood pumping, help just get a mental reset. Right. So all of a sudden you come back to your computer, you feel re-energized and you'll probably be more productive, honestly. Uh, versus just trying to stay at your computer all day long. Um, you know, I, I try to take little mini breaks like that um, throughout the day. Um, and in terms of like overall work-life balance, um, I always I always think about my health and how if you sacrifice your health trying to get rich, well, then you'll end up with nothing in the end. Your health is really the number one asset that you have. And so it's important to take care of your health so that you can be there for your kids and uh, over the long term, right? And so I just try to keep those things in mind and also how kids grow up so fast, which they do. They grow up extremely fast, you know. In the moment, it feels like forever. You're like, oh my gosh, when are they finally going to stop crying or <laughs> be able to, you know, wipe themselves or whatever. But all that stuff passes pretty quickly. And then all of a sudden you go, oh my gosh, they're not this age anymore. Like... I miss that. Like we're done doing this. I mean, there's, there's a, every kid reaches an age where you say, Hey dad, let's, you know, or um, you say, Hey, let's go to the park. And they're like, well, dad, I don't want to go to the park. I'm too old for that. You know, and it's over. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want to go to the park anymore. Yeah. So you mean, time goes quickly. Yeah. So just uh, take advantage of it while you can. Right. Yeah. And so you don't realize you missed the time. And money doesn't doesn't yep. buy your time again. And I also would like to add that you 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 said it right that sometimes you need to put more work to get more money if you if you struggle to find money and your your budget sure. is is not in a good condition. But to get money and to get more money, you need to to have an energy. Otherwise, yep. it yeah, doesn't do. mean how how much you work. It, it doesn't make you rich or it doesn't cover your bills, your, your, your debits, anything. You have to find the energy, you have to sleep, you have to eat, you have to relax anyways. Otherwise, you don't get any results. Doesn't matter how hard you try. Right. So I right. recommend you guys make sure you have an energy, make sure you have your balance in your health. Of course, health is the most important thing your health and once you, you you set up your 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 balance in this part you have an energy to to pull it pull your 
like success pull your success and get some results from what you do from your business from your applic application from your startup from your career from your work in in the office anywhere it doesn't it doesn't matter but to mm -hmm. to to step forward to move forward you have to have some energy yeah absolutely absolutely yeah so yeah, um, and the last thing I think we are close to the to the end of this great podcast, and I would love to ask you for some advice for someone wanting to start a career in in email marketing niche, in copywriting, and in in everything related to that. What would be your advice, or or do you recommend to find some? new positions focus on something else if if the people if people would love to start copywriting career right now is it a still a good idea to be a copywriting freelancer considering there is so much noise around it right now so uh, your advice for people who just start their career i, I it's a it's a tough question right yeah. um i would say that copywriting is still um it's still viable. It's still a good career choice, but to be successful, I think you need to have something that sets you apart and that makes you unique. Just saying, Oh, I'm a copywriter or I'm a copy expert. It's like, okay. You know, there's a lot of people saying that and some people can write copy and some can't. So it doesn't really tell me a whole lot. So I think spend a lot of time thinking, okay, what is it? about me that makes me unique that I can sell to the mm. market. So for me, I realized with my background, I could talk about how I worked at Merrill Lynch in the financial industry. And I could talk about how I got my series six license. And so I had some things that I, I'm like, well, maybe I should play that up and just say, Hey, I can write financial copy because of my past experience. And then the other thing I did was I talked, you know, I already mentioned this earlier, but Hey, I'll help you split test your copy. You know, there weren't other copywriters doing that at the time, you know, so that kind of set me apart, you know, are they going to hire the guy who just gives them the copy and then that's it? Or are they going to hire the guy who gives them the copy and then helps them, you know, optimize it. Right. So I'm not saying you have to do that. It's just that you should be thinking about how you can position yourself apart from everybody else who's saying they're a copywriter. In other words, why should I hire you instead of the other guy? And so I don't think copywriters think enough about that. I really don't, you know, they just think like, Oh, I'm a copywriter. I'll, I'll get sales for you. So hire me, you know? <laughs> well, that's, that's why we are here. We try to explain how it should be from the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that that's that's kind of my take on it. I I also would suggest if it's possible, at least early in your career, to work with one client or one agency or something like that for a short period of time. You know, maybe it's six months, maybe it's a year, but that way you can get your your reps in and you can write a lot of copy and you can get feedback quickly and all this. Whereas if you're trying to go from one freelance client to another, sometimes your client won't run your copy. You know, they just, they get sidetracked because we're all entrepreneurs, right? You know, somebody comes with an idea. Hey, I'm so excited. Write copy for this. So you write copy for it and you turn it in and then you go, Hey, did you run the copy? They're like, Oh yeah, I didn't, I, I decided I didn't want to do that anymore. I decided I want to do mm -hmm. this. Well, yeah, you, you got paid, but you're not getting feedback from the market. You know, you're not, and that's tough, right? And so in other times the client will run the copy, but then they'll never tell you. Did it do good? Did it do bad? You just, you just don't know. Um, you can ask and sometimes they won't tell you. So um, at least if you're working with one client and you're more integrated in their business, you get more insight into what's happening with your copy, right? Did it run the way you wrote it? Was it changed? is, you know, how many sales did it generate? And I, I just feel like that kind of, uh, that feedback loop, it builds confidence, it builds experience. And I think you just get better faster. So, um, if you have that opportunity as a copywriter, I suggest that, that it's probably worth taking. And then you can go out freelance after that 
and start and even when you're freelancing you still want retainers so I, I I tell I've written about this to my list before to my email list is that the worst year I ever had with uh, copywriting um, was after two different retainer agreements had ended and I didn't have any active retainer agreements. Yeah. And so that caused a lot of cash flow issues because clients will say, Hey, check is in the mail. Check is in the mail. No, it's not in the mail until it, you have it. You don't have it. So what ended up happening is like payments I thought were going to come in one month then, then, then came in the next month and then it just, it was a mess. So, um, so even after you, like if you move away from like a, an employee type of position or just working with one client, you'll still want to have some multiple retainer agreements in place so that your cash flow is strong and that if one retainer agreement leaves, you still have others in place. Um, and I don't recommend selling all of your time in retainer agreements, but you could sell half for sure. And then you could take the other half of your time and then fill that with projects. And then the retainer agreements give you leverage to negotiate higher fees on the projects that you do accept. All right. Thank you. So, so first thing, yeah. uh, getting a feedback all the time, try to get as much feedback from your clients as possible. Try to do work well mm -hmm. instead of focusing on quick money and never never forget about sales even when you have enough client especially when you have enough client we we had the same issue mm -hmm. when we started we were we were completely in the projects wow everything is great but then like 10 projects completed bam at the same time and you're done like what's next <laughs> so you lose money you lose time you you need one two months to to find next good clients so make sure you always follow the flow I completely agree yeah. and try to sell all the time. Even you are full, you can schedule it for the next month, next year. Some clients ready yes. to wait. Sometimes, sometimes it's urgent, sometimes it's not. So it's not your business. You just try to, to keep your clients right. I absolutely agree with it. And I think, um, this is good, good time to call it ready podcast for our uh, subscribers thank you ryan very much i i really liked it a lot and I, I i hope to see your list of books we also attach everything your website and linkedin to you to to this podcast and to the to the description of the video uh so please everyone who is interested in email marketing in list management contact upsender.com you can find all contacts on their contacts page and uh, at least you can you can try free audit. It's free, obviously. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, no yeah. obligations. All right, perfect. So I I wish everyone a great day. It's a Friday today, so it's time to call it a week and enjoy our weekend. But we probably post it later. So just enjoy every day of your life. And thanks again, Ryan. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. Thank you and hope we can speak again. And I wish you best yeah, of luck with good. your family, with your lifestyle balance and with your business. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah.